change anyway, right? Right. Let me share this whiteboard with you all, right? So this is normally sometimes shown like this. Reasonably practicable is sometimes shown like a seesaw, right? And in the seesaw, or should I say on the seesaw, you have risk on one side. And what they're saying, the employer have to balance the risk against the cost it will take to do that, the time it will take to do that, and the effort it will take to reduce the risk, right? Now, some people tend to think that this is like a cop out for the employer, cost, time, and effort, right? Um, however, it's not a cop out for the employer. It's a way they say for, sorry, not, not really for, but, but it's a way you know, to make it fair to the employer so that the employees don't always sue them, right? What they will look at, they have to look at, does the employer have the money to reduce the risk? Uh, how much time it will take to reduce the risk and what effort it will take to reduce the risk. So this level of duty makes it fair that it makes it fair that if the employer have the money, the time and the effort, they would reduce the risk. And again, this is really meant for stuff that is like low to medium risk. Um, if, for example, they don't have the money, they don't have the time, then it may be um, unreasonable for them to reduce the risk, right? This is a little bit complicated. Let me just try to clear that there, but it's a little bit complicated. But um, the first piece of it is knowing that reasonably practicable means you have to balance the, the risk against cost, time, and effort. Right, think I get out a little bit first and then, 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 then we'll take it from there. Yes, everyone? Yeah. Let me see who else I have there again. Okay, with that piece, so find that you are balancing the risk against cost, time, and effort. Yes, yes. it's very quiet. Okay, all right. Um, so you may need some examples to help you understand this one, right? So I would use an example of an office, just join like a schematic here, right? So let's say this is a small um, office, right? And uh, so that's the office there, I just put an O, right? Um, this is maybe a stock room, whatever have you, right? So stock room there. And this to the back here is your welfare facility, right? So that's welfare, that's your toilets and whatever have you. Now in this company that I've drawn here, this scenario, I only have five employees. Uh, let's say the ratio to that five is really three males to two females, right? So there would be, I should say that there would be separate washrooms here for both males and females. Now, this is what we're getting at. We are saying, let's say the employees decided to sue this company for the sake that they have been asking for another washroom to be built here. Now there is sufficient washrooms, we can probably say there is four units, right? Uh, two for the males, two for the females, right? So there are four units, yet still the employees are asking for another washroom. Now, how would the employer know if that is something reasonable to do, right? How would the employer know, if, well, should I really build another four units, I already have four, there's only five employees, right? So that, 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 that's almost one wash, washroom per, like, like per person. What the employer will do, that is when we come back to the definition, what they will do, and if it was to go to court, it's the same thing, the judge would have to do the same thing. They will balance the level of risk against cost, time, I just put a T, and effort, right? Cost, time, an effort to do that. So you have to consider, right? And I say in the employer, you have to consider if it was to go before a judge, a judge would have to consider what is the risk, right? What is the risk? And I wanted to help with this. Remember we did this, um, uh, we kind of touched on this before that risk could have been low, medium, and high, right? So what do you think the risk is here? I have five employees. There's four units available at the moment. With the risk of keeping it as the four units be high, medium, or low? Anyone can answer? What do you think? It'll be low. Huh? Right, it'll be low, right? Okay, so it'll be low because, I mean, it is almost as if everybody has their own washroom, right? 
So the risk is low. So this is what I say, if the risk is low, the employer can say right now, the cost to possibly build a washroom, you're looking at probably about maybe 20 to 30,000 TT, right? In an office space anyway, four units, right? So they can say, well, the cost for that is too high. It's going to take us a lot of time, probably take us about a month, four weeks anyway. It's going to take a lot of effort, right? So because if, so see if you can see this, because the risk is low and the money is high, in a way, what they are saying then, they don't have to do this. The risk is low. If the risk was high, they would have had to find the, the, the money, make the time and the effort to get it done. But the risk is low. So in a way, this seesaw would swing the other way. The, the risk would have to be low. The seesaw would be like this. But the money value attached to reduce the risk is high. So in a way, this is being fair to the employer. If the risk is low and the money is attached rate is high, what they are saying, the employer does not have to build this additional four units, right? It's a way that of being fair to the employer. Now, if they didn't say that, if the law didn't say, so far as this reason, it'd be practicable, which is what we're looking at. It means that anybody that put a request on the employer, right? If the word, if we go back to the PowerPoint, if, if the word was absolute, right? If the line was absolute, then anybody that requests something as simple as this, it would have had to be done irrespective of how much money it would have cost. So when you see this phrase in the law, so far as is reasonably practical, but it is an attempt by the law, yes, to be fair to the employee if the risk was high, but if the risk is low, it is an attempt to be fair to the employee, sorry, the, the, the employer, so that they wouldn't have to spend, you know, a high amount of money to already reduce something that would have been, that would have been low risk anyway. Think you get it a bit? I'll do one more. I'll do, just to clear that one. I'll do one more. We're looking at the same thing. The same, everyone can draw it up here as well. The whole thing about so far as this reason, every practical but means the employer, and I'm saying the employer first because it's up to them. If, for instance, something goes to court, it would now become in the, on the realm of the judges then, right? So the whole thing about reason, every practicable, you balance the risk against cost, you balance the risk against time, I'll try to draw a clock there, I guess, right? Cost, time, and uh, effort. Effort is another word for manpower, right? So cost, time, and effort. And um, in this example, what I'll draw, I'll draw a scaffold. Right, so if we have a scaffold, part of a scaffold anyway, right? And let's say in this scaffold, I am not gonna go up with the guard rails. I'm, I'm gonna leave it right there, right? Which may be the level of the tour board, right? Uh, the rails are supposed to be a bit higher up, right? So there is somebody up here, there's someone here, and this person is leaning over right here. And the thing here now is that this company has not provided a harness. So how do we know it's reasonably practicable for the company to provide a harness? How do we know, right? The company can say, somebody can say like a harness is like about five to $600. Right? Now, how do we know that's a reasonable cost to pay? Well, you come back to the level of risk, right? Is the level of risk the same thing? Is it low? Is it medium? Or is it high for this person here? It's going to be? High. It's going to be high, right? So because the level of risk is high, what they say now is that because the risk is high, the onus is now on the employer to come and find the money, make the time and the effort to reduce the risk. Think you get to it a bit? The employer have to find the money, make the time, put in the effort to go and buy the harnesses to reduce the, to reduce the risk, right? So this is what they use. In fact, I was telling a class before um, that we use the same thing in our, we use, when I mean we, all of us, we use the same thing in our everyday life, right? Um, I guess I'll use an example of, I'll come back to this course in a bit, right? I'll come back to a course example in a bit, right? But I'll use an example of maybe, uh, let's say you are going uh, to the mall, right? The malls have been open back this week anyway. Um, so let's say you're going to the mall, and uh, you are going to buy, I guess, a pair of shoes, right? So you're going to buy a pair of shoes. 
And, um, you know, you want to know, is it reasonable to buy that pair of shoes, right? So you look at your monies, and when they say the same $600 here, right? So you look at your monies, you have the money, you can make the time to go down to the mall, and you'll make the effort if it means, you know, I guess going there a bit earlier, waiting in a line, waiting to be served one at a time in the store, right? Once you can do all of these, once you can find the money, the time and the effort, to you, it becomes reasonable to go and buy that pair of shoes, right? You understand that? If it was, if any one of these is missing, if any one of these is missing, you would see it becomes unreasonable. Let's say, for example, you had the money. You had the money to buy the shoes, but you were working late, right? And maybe let's say it's a shoe to somebody else. Maybe, you know, your better half, right? Or your worse off half, whichever half anyway, right? So you have the money, but you were working late anyway, so you didn't have the time, right? You didn't have the time, you make the effort and you make the effort, come up the road maybe from point forward and you make the effort to get into the mall, but you didn't make it in time, right? So you got home and you know, your significant other is saying, you know, well, how come you didn't get the shoes? And then you say, you know, well, you know, I had the time, sorry, I had the money, I made the effort, but it was a little bit late, I worked over time. And I'm just saying, suppose the person decided to be a bit upset with you, your logical explanation is that you are being unreasonable, right? The person is being unreasonable because you made the effort, you had the money, but you just didn't have the time. So what you're saying is that if any one of these is missing, it becomes unreasonable to do what you have to do. Remember the code word in this one here is so far as is reasonably practicable. So once you have all three, it becomes reasonable for you to do something. Case in point, I was saying this course, right? The course that you all have signed up for. You would have had to judge how much money it would have cost, right? So once you can probably see the money, you tell yourself, okay, I think I would want to go and sign up for the Nibosh course, right? It may become reasonable for me to do that. You look at the time, we realize the time is now on Zoom. You say, okay, the time is half 12 to one or half one and a half. Saturday that you can probably do that fine it becomes reasonable but then you make the effort you know to get ready and to come and you know to sit before the computer so once you have all three it becomes reasonable you understand that so the key word here is that once the employer have cost time and effort it becomes reasonable for them to reduce the risk based though on the level of risk if the risk is almost as high if it is high though what they say is that it is almost known that you have to go and find the cost, time, and effort to reduce the risk anyway, right? Um, all in all, uh, all of that, let me go back and get back to this slides. All of that really comes for two marks, which is just simply saying what is meant by the term uh, reasonably practicable. And it is just these two lines here. The employer must balance the level of risk with cost, time, and effort to avoid or to avert the level of risk, right? You can probably, when the class is finished, I guess, think of it in a practical sense, right? Um, as, I, as I was trying to do there, if you have the time, if you have the, the money and you can make the effort, right? For example, maybe going, I'm going to use the mall again, but, but possibly going somewhere makes sense, right? If you don't have the time, you don't have the money, it doesn't make sense. So then it will seem to you to be unreasonable, right? So this was said to employers so that it would be fair to them and not to allow the, um, the, the, the employees really to take advantage of them anyway, right? Um, so that is it for that first concept, right? That was it there. Um, what I probably should add though, I should add, and I don't know if you'll think about what I'm gonna tell you or think about it now. What I should say is that um, of the three levels of duty, absolute, right, which says the employer must do something, practicable means they must do it in light of current knowledge. If everybody has know about that, the ZED seven glasses, the, the, um, the red wing boots, that is the best type of PPE, right? If everybody knows about that type of boot, but that's what should be given to the workers anyway, right? You can't expect them to attack the other brand that is still in the developmental stage, maybe somewhere in Japan or whatever have you, right? So practicable, and then the last one reason I'd be practicable, of the three of them, um, the one that is in the TT Ash Act, 
the Trinidad and Tobago Asha, right, is the last one, right? Reasonably practical, but the one that's in the UK law as well is actually this, actually the UK may differ, right? There are some lines in the UK that end with absolute, as you're seeing here. There are some lines that end with, as, 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 I, said, as I said before, these may be finishing sentences, right? So there are some lines in the UK law that end with the phrase reasonably practicable, if I can go back. There are some lines that end with practicable in the UK, and there are some lines that end with absolute or shall in the UK. In Trinidad and Tobago, though, all of them end with the word reasonably practicable. Right? I don't know if you understand what that means. Um, some people see that as a washing down then of the Osh Act, right? Um, in that it almost makes it possible then for all employers to say they don't have the cost time, they don't have the cost they, that they wouldn't make the time and they would not make the effort to reduce the risk, right? But that's how it's written in the TT Osh Act. Um, all of them, they end with the phrase um, so far as is, this phrase at the bottom here, right? So far as is reasonably practicable, right? The big justification though is that it makes it fair to the employer, but at the same time, there isn't anything in the OSHA saying absolute, right? Or practicable. All of them seem to be that the employer has a defense. And that may be good for employers, but it means that um, if they don't have the money, then they're not obligated to reduce risk any further, you know, that employees may be facing anyway, right? So if, um, if, if you have any time, you could probably, if you haven't looked at the Oshakas yet, take a look at it. Part two in particular is the, is the duty on the um, employer. And you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see all of it ends with that phrase, um, reasonably practicable. Any comments there? And I'll get a chance to catch my breath a little bit. If not, I'll move down a bit. All right, so that was um, that was one of the harder concepts anyway, right? Um, let me get a drink of water, right? So, um, so the other one would have been common law. This is what we mentioned a bit last week. Um, I think all I can do here is explain some of this for you. Um, so we wouldn't read every single thing on it, right? So. If you remember from last week, we were saying that laws could be of two types. You have what is known as statute law, and then you have common law, right? So I think we mentioned that statute law was law made, made, by, the, made by the government, made by parliament. And common law would have been the law that is disseminated then, like from a judge. It's as if you go before a judge, and the judge gives a judgment, a sentence, and then in a way, what that judge is saying, his or her words is seen to be as good as law, and that is referred to as common law, right? The long story you're seeing on this slide here is a bit of history. You're gonna see things like um, the Norman conquest of England, that was actually Vikings, right? In 1066, you're gonna see King Henry in the 12th century, and before that, even the 11th century, they, they, they use the same names, right? So you find up to today, you have um, uh, Prince Henry there, you still have the same name, right? You have Henry, right? I'll show you all about the wedding and stuff that, that occurred a couple of years ago. They still use the same name, say, so this is Henry II. So you can only imagine it had a Henry before him in the 11th century, right? Anyway, if anybody have ever, um, has anyone seen that show on, it used to be on HBO called it, uh, the, I think it was the Tudors, T-U-D-O-R-S, the Tudors, T-U-D-O-R-S, anybody saw that show? No. Anyway, it's, it's the history of um, the Queen is a history of how the Queen is the Queen of England today, right? It was a big um, blockbuster show almost on the same level as um, that one that ended last year. What was the one that ended last year? I really don't look at them anyway. Um, Game of Thrones, right? It was actually the one that had before Game of Thrones. Anyway, 
long story here is that what started to happen here, the history lesson here, what started to happen is that the kings, right? You can call them King Henry and whatever have you, right? So the kings from England, they started to collect cases. They started to collect cases and like in the counties in which they were overseeing, right? Remember just a bit of history here that Trinidad and Tobago was under the queen, right? And uh, you find, you know, like our history then is rich with the English his rich with the English history. We still use in Trinidad, we still use counties, right? If you are from San Fernando, this is the county of uh, Victoria. If you are from the Separia, you know, I think point forth inside you in the county of uh, St. Patrick, right? So what I'm saying is I think of it like that, right? The only thing with the counties in England, Trinidad is an island, so a county is small and it's kind of, you know, it's just Separia and the environs anyway. But a county in the UK could be as large as a state, as we know, like the state of Texas, New York, etc. So when you had these governors and these rulers in the UK, right, in England anyway, they started to collect the cases in their counties. So like you'll find, they would have collected, from, I'm, I'm going to use the word St. Patrick, but of course in England they have different counties like Manchester, Right, you have the, you, have, you have different places that you have Leicestershire, right? And what they realized was that they realized that what somebody was going through in St. Patrick is common to what somebody is going through in, you know, um, St. Joseph. And that in St. Patrick, you have two, two neighbors. I'm going to use neighbors because back here didn't have a lot of employers and employee regulations as yet. So you may have two neighbors fighting for a piece of land or maybe one neighbor and his, you know, his animals are going into the other neighbor's land and then that was a dispute. But then they, they actually collected that and then they realized in, in St. Joseph that same problem was happening, you know, as well, right? So what they decided to do, they decided to make something called the doctrine of precedent. Precedent means that the judgment they give in St. Patrick must not be reflected in the judgment that they are given in St. Joseph. And that the judge, if you are hearing a case in a different county, and you can say it today in a different country, right? Before the judge make a judgment, they have to consider the decree of what was said before in a similar case. That is what they call a precedent. Think again that a bit. I was telling a class this, um, I don't think I have a pity of video. If you have ever seen, have you ever seen um, this statue? I don't think I have it here, but have you ever seen, you must have seen it on television. Have you ever seen the statue of justice? It's, it's a statue of a lady. Have you ever seen that statue? A statue, it's, it's in front of the courts, like in the Separia court, is in front of Princess Town Court. Have you all ever seen the statue of? Yes, yes. It, okay, it's a lady and she's holding yes. what's in her yes. hand. Anybody could remember it? Yeah. Oh. Right, she's like holding a balance. Like a balance yes. in her yes. hand. Right, right. Yeah, and. Um, if you get a chance to look at the statue again, what you notice is that the lady is blindfolded. The statue of justice is blindfolded. Now, why would they blindfold a statue, right? The, the purpose of blindfolding the statue is, is really a hint to tell the judge, don't just look with your eyes, but look back then at precedent. Don't just look at the case that is before you, but look back at the doctrine of precedent, meaning that has there been a similar case to this? And what the doctrine of precedent means, if you look at the word here, if you find one that is similar to your case, you are bound, you are bound or, 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 or you are bind, right, to use the same precedent. They call it binding precedent, right? So you are bound to, to be ruled in a similar way to the old judgment that was there before. Um, again, some of them may not be too old, but you may have very old judgments going back to the 11th and the 12th century anyway, right? 
if you want, I can give you an example. I'm looking at the time. Um, to give you the example, do I have to, have to go forward with the slides, right? There, there, there is an example in this, but it's a bit forward on the slides. Let me just go a little bit forward with the slide, and I'll kind of try to bring this point home, right? So we, and this is way forward in this slide. This is almost the last concept, right? The reason is that the last concept have a bit of common law in it, right? So good, it's right around here somewhere, right? So, right, this here. So this is an example of what we call precedent, right? Um, this here was a case that happened in 1932, right? I'll just kind of summarize and I'll read it in a bit. What happened here was that there was a lady, her name was May Donahue. I think of a pity of the cafe. There, there is a memorial to her in the state that she's from. And I say the state, but it's really a county that she's from. It's called Praise Day in the UK. And this is a worldwide case. Now, worldwide case means it's a precedent anywhere in the world, right? It's not just health and safety. If I have any law students here, if somebody was studying law, this is the same case that you would study. What happened here in 1932 was that she had um, a ginger beer to drink in a bar. Now, I know the picture looks black and white. Um, however, though, what I've realized is that when I was in England, it looks just like that in the night. The English buildings, um, England is described as the old world. The buildings are pretty old looking, right? It's there from all the centuries anyway. There's little glass used in construction, right? So this is about the only picture that was available on um, the internet when we created this slide about maybe five years ago anyway. But she had this beer to drink and the beer was in a bottle that was like um, a Guinness bottle, right? Or I guess a Malta bottle or a Smalter bottle for those of us who are not into the world of Guinness, right? So it wasn't a bit of a dark colored bottle. So they say here, no one noticed the snail, right? The long story was that she got sick and she sued the beer company, which was something called Stevenson's and Sons. Now, Stevenson's is a brand of beer in England. You can still get it today. Stevenson's is like Carib, right? Or Stag. Uh, Stevenson's is like Samuel Adams, if you're familiar with some of the American beers. You can still get a Stevenson beer in the UK today, right? The long and short of this is that she, she sued the beer company for the snail in the bottle. My question to you is, without going further here, do you think she won that case? The beer company would have said, you know, that they're not responsible for that and whatever have you, right? So just, just a guess, do you think that she won the case? Yes, I think she won. Yes, I, yes, I think she won. I guess because we're talking about it, means it's pressing. <laughs> right um so the judge in it, the judge in the case right his name was lord atkin the judges carried that title behind them lord atkin and what he said was that he said now even though they did not know who she was and you know wherever that manufacturing plant is it's probably not even in Priestley anyway but the judge established something called the neighbor principle meaning that a neighbor is somebody who is affected by you, right? Um, if you are, like I said, playing loud music, your neighbors could be affected by you. So he established what is what is called a neighbor principle, meaning that even though they did not know her, what they put in the bottle affected her. And the long and short of this is that she won the case and, uh, and there's a reason why there is a memorial to her is because the case, she just didn't win it but it became a precedent even till today. What it means is that today, and I've given you a real example now, right, Janet, I don't know what I'm talking about. Today, if someone decides to, in fact, I'm going to back up a bit, right? If someone opens a pack of sunshine snacks, right, this is 2020, maybe you partake in a Carib or a Guinness, and you find something in it that you didn't put in it and there are witnesses and cameras and stuff to bear testament to that. And you take that beer company to court or you take Sunshine Snacks to court. What we are saying is that the judge here in that case in Separia, in San Fernando, in Princess Town, the judge that is here in the case of Shadrach versus Sunshine Snacks, right? 
or Shadrach versus, um, you know, the manufacturers, SMG lead, whatever have you. The judge in that case, even though it's Separia, even if it's Princess Song with San Fernando or Arima, the judge have to look at Donahue versus Stevenson. The judge have to close their eyes to what's happened in Separia and refer to Donahue versus Stevenson. That is the power and that is, that is the importance of if something is precedent and what they what the power is, is that if the circumstances are all the same and that the person didn't put anything into the beer bottle or the sunshine snacks pack, then the judge of today have to rule in a similar manner to the judge in Donahue versus Stevenson, 1932, right? To what Lord Atkin had done. That's the purpose of common law and that's the purpose of precedent. Thank you, understanding? Yeah. Yes. Um, anyway, I have to go all the way back up, right? Um, so there is an example there of the of the of what is called precedent. Just keep this in the back of your mind now. As you see a judge today, of Judge Judy on this slide here, right? Uh, when judgments are being made, they have to consider precedents, which would have been from the 11th century to now. That's hundreds and hundreds of years. There must have been somebody going through something that you would have gone through. And if they could find a similar precedent, the judge have to really not close their eyes totally, but they have to not just consider what is in front of them, but they have to consider the precedent that was set before them. That is why it's called a binding precedent on the court, right? In a way then, you know, in a way then, the, the hands of the judges are tied in that they have to rule in a similar manner. And that is what is called the doctrine of precedent. Yes? I'm looking at the time. I am not too sure where did that hour go. All right? Um, I'm actually not finished with, it, with the third concept anyway. I think what I can do is probably just read you some of this here. And we'll probably just bring it down to an end right about here anyway. Right? So I'll just read, I wouldn't explain anything again. Um, all of that there was unprecedented, right? So for common law, the burden of proof is placed on the claimant. Um, the claimant is you, the person that is claiming. Remember in common law, it's not the government, unless if you're suing the government, I guess, right? But it's not really the employer and the employee. Or should I say it could be the employer and the employee, but it's not the state. It's not the state. It's like an employer. Yes, and it could be an employee, right? Uh, an employer, sorry, an employee suing an employer, right? But, it, but the burden of proof will be on the employee to prove their case or maybe to hire a lawyer to help them prove their case, right? The claimant or his lawyer or her lawyer must prove the case on a balance of probabilities. Um... Again, this is further discussed on this slide that was on there before, just about precedent with Donahue versus Stevenson. This is like we said later on. The balance of probabilities mean you have certain things to prove, right? I don't know if you want to look at that at me. I have to go all the way back down. There are three things you have to prove, right? I'll probably say it, say it and try to get it at the same time, right? So the, the three things the employee have to prove or his employer have to prove, the first is that you have to prove that they owe you a duty of care, right? The three things to win any case worldwide, you have to prove a duty of care was owed. It was just after here, if you're looking for it. So look at there, right? You have to prove a duty of care was owed. Um, yeah, some people say, no, well, how do I prove that? It's easy to prove that. No, we can prove that with your contract. If you have a contract, right? In which, you know, you sign on the you said and the employer signed, so you have a contract, right? You have to prove the duty of care was breached. And then the last and probably the most important one, you have to prove that because of the breach, you have suffered injury or you have suffered some sort of loss anyway. Um, we say it's a balance of probabilities because again, it's like that see so thing. I don't want to go back into that, that uh, whiteboard. I'll just tell you, but it's like you have to prove that tree, but then the employer have to defend himself. So if you look at this slide, I guess, in your free time, the employer will have to defend himself. So it is like a seesaw. You are trying to prove your case. I'm sure we have seen this on TV before, like court cases before. So the, the employee is trying to prove a duty of care, you know, was owed. The employer trying to prove the duty of care was not owed, or it was not breached, right? 
you're trying to prove that they breached it and they say no they didn't breach it you, you're trying to prove that you were injured and they could be trying to prove well, well here what well, yes you were injured but you were doing something you know negligent you was on your own you understand we talk about this next week anyway so that's why they say on a balance of probabilities if it can go all the way back up that is what i said and that kind of tied into that slide here right the duty of care is on the claimant and you have to prove it's on a balance of probabilities it involves a dispute between two parties when a tort now this word is not spelled wrong this is the correct spelling of this word the only thing with this word is not an english word it's really a latin word right and the word really means wrongdoing so it involves a dispute between two parties when a wrongdoing has been committed or has resulted in negligence you could use the word tort because that is what they would look for in exam the party that is wronged is compensated by the wrongdoer Claims for tort or personal injuries must occur within tort is six years, injuries three years. Next week, I can I clear this up a bit because of the time, right? Breaches by the employer results in the claimant being compensated by the employer's liability insurance. We had covered that before. Types of law, so we mentioned this before, criminal law, civil law, so I can skip that one out. Criminal law is really, a, um, you know, it's like when you break the law of the land, you are seen as a criminal. If you take up a civil matter with a, with a source of law that you're, you're kind of tapping into, the source of law is the laws collected from the 11th and 12th century, that being common law, right? Just to get to the exam question to kind of close this off. So this would be your homework for the week, but the answers are right here on this slide. Uh, normally when they ask this, they ask what is the difference between, uh, again, they could, they could use the word interchangeably, they can say common law here, and statute law because it's one in the same criminal law is a type of statute law civil law is a type of common law so they can ask this question anyway they could just switch on the words the differences are the same anyway what's the difference between civil law and criminal law what's the difference between common law and statute law the answers is the same what we have on this chart here right um let me just I want to try to get that shot a bit bigger there for you all. But you all can see that clearly enough, I guess. I'm not too sure it looks on your screen. Is this readable on your screen? Yes. And it's, it's a little bit readable on my screen, I guess, right? I'm yes. Not, yeah, I guess if you have um, if you have this PowerPoint, and I know some people printed it, a good thing to do is probably to print this as a full sheet so you can look at it, right? So I'll just do two because of the time, right? We have passed our time. Um, i just do two differences. So a difference, and we had done two last week already, a difference between criminal law and civil law. Criminal law, the source would have been the state. Remember, if you break the law of the land, you're seen as a criminal, right? And if it's a state, it means it has to go through parliament, it takes the form of acts, regulations, etc. Civil law, we just said, is all about those judges and them. The source is common law, it's made by judges, and it was developed over many centuries to which they got this doctrine of precedent, all cases that they can go back and look at, right? That's one difference, another difference. The purpose of criminal law, remember criminal law is like, uh, is like the government inspectors now coming down on the employer. So the purpose is to punish the employers, whereas if you take someone to court, you are getting what is called redress. Redress is another word for justice. Justice is another word for compensation. In civil law, you will be getting money. The outcome of it, when you take the employer to court or you take a fellow neighbor to court, nobody is going to jail. What you are going to get, you're going to get justice for the wrong that you suffered. If somebody is on your land, if you would have been wrongfully fired, right? If you'd have been, you know, a victimized, uh, you know, worker, victimization or whatever have you, you are getting justice in the form of money but the employer is not going to jail. It's two types of law. So as you go through them, you'll see many other differences. I could probably just highlight one more. I think we touched on that one today and last week. Um, the burden of proof. The burden of proof must be beyond all reasonable doubt for um, criminal law. And if you read through here, the burden of proof, we had just finished this point here, the burden of proof for Civil law for common law is on a balance of probabilities. What they mean by that, I said it before, it's just like as what you see on TV sometimes. Um, your lawyer is saying one thing and then the prosecution is saying another thing. So it is really a balance of probabilities in that you are trying to prove 
duty of care was owed, they're trying to prove it was not owed, etc. Now, this would only come for four months. Um, so, you know, it, I mean, there's way more than four points here. So if you're gonna learn the differences, it's just four, four points to learn in respect of the differences. This does not come for more than four marks anyway. Right, um, I wanted to, I'm looking at the time, right? I would want to briefly just share something with you all. I know that, um, I think somebody sent me it already, right? It could have been Julian, right? Um, so I'll mention it a little bit, right? Um, Julian, how did you get that though? I saw it on um, Facebook, right. right? And I wanted to query about it. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Right, okay, so um, the, the, what we are talking about is that, I, I don't know if I have it saved here, I'm not too sure, because I have it saved on this chair screen, right? If not, again, I'll keep talking based on the time as I try to look for it, right? It's, it's somewhere there, but I'm not, I'm not seeing it on the share screen. I have to go and find it in my documents, right? So I'll, I'll leave it as is. I'll just talk about this. So what we're talking about is that, um, is that uh, Nibosh created based on the corona virus, right? Um, in fact, that's wrong to say. They, 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 they are now creating, right? The, the, the essence behind it is that they are looking into creating an open book exam, right? For countries that cannot need to have the physical written exam, right? Next week, if you want to share some details with you, it is um, in the developmental stages because there is no dates for it as yet. But just in a nutshell, what it will be, it will be where you have to, same thing, pay for your exam when that time comes, but instead of requesting the written exam, you request an online exam. You, 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 request the, you, you request the open book exam, right? To which time they will give you a day and a login to go on their platform. And what the open book exam is, is a bunch of case studies, right? So we'll talk about the pros and cons of this, I think, next week anyway. It's case studies that they look at. You are free to use your books, you're free to use the internet, you're free to use all resources available, but you have to follow reference and rules, right? If you don't reference, if you don't uh, you know, give the information sources so we are getting them, they could see it as plagiarism, at which case your project will get zero, right? The focus of the exam would not be memory, right? If you look at what we have on this slide here, this is really a memory-based question. What's the difference between criminal law and civil law. That's a memory-based question, right? Or in the online exam or, or in the open book exam, the focus would not be memory, but it would be analysis, or should I say critical analysis. So I see this as something being much harder than the normal exam. The other thing is that they said that you have, um, you will be having, you have 24 hours to do it. Now, it don't mean you'll be taking, you know, 24 hours to actually get it done. They recommend about four to five hours, but at the end of that day, then at the end of that 24 hour period, they will log you out the site. You'll be logged off the site, meaning that whatever you did will be taken as a submission anyway, right? So just to repeat this, they are coming up with, we have no set dates, um, an open book exam for the certificate students who cannot congregate, or should I say in countries in which you cannot congregate for the rest of the year. Now, by all means, and what we've been seeing is that Trinidad and Tobago, and from the Ministry of Education, they have given September, you know, to be the open of school, right? September the 1st anyway. So once we can congregate, I would recommend that we go on with the, with the, uh, with the academic or the written-based exam, because I have not seen, nor have anyone seen, what is the structure of this open book exam. For instance, how long are the case studies? Is it four pages long for one question? You understand, what, what, what will make you stay there for four to five hours? It has to be something that is longer than just a, a question like this then, a question that says, what's the difference between civil and criminal law, right? 
So um, this will be open to you all as well. Again, going forward in September and in December, whenever we have exams, that option will be an alternative. If you don't want to sit the written exam, irrespective of COVID, once they come up with it, they will come up with it worldwide, Nibosh are talking about. So there will be an option to sit an open book exam as well as the regular written exam, right? So you let me know what you think about that. Uh, maybe next week as it's new news for everybody. And uh, we can probably talk about the pros and cons of it. And let me know. I already have. I have somebody in one of my other classes. Um, uh, a young lady that is uh, pregnant and she is expecting um, September, right? So she have already said that she would be interested in the open book exam. And I think she's expecting twins. <laughs> she's expecting twins. So she would be open you know, to see what this open book exam is all about anyway, right? So um, you will let me know I am in favor, though, of the written exam because I can safely guide you through the questions as opposed to, you know, you sitting behind some new form of examination that we have never seen that form before, right? So I guess in the coming months, we could um, talk about it. It will be available for all students, whether or not I like it or I do like it, it would be available for all students anyway in the coming months, right? And I suppose it would be a good, um, a good tool for those students in the countries where they cannot meet, countries like England itself, where you have a high number of deaths, it would be a good tool for them anyway, right? So I'll bring this one down. Um, I guess I should have probably stopped the recording a long time ago, right? That's